Hello, beautiful people. It is that time. My favorite top reviews for the year 2020. I do want to state that these are just books that I read in 2020. They were not published in 2020. Some of them are classics that have been around for centuries, but I just encountered them this year. And I will also state that these are the books that over the year, oh, you know what? I had to pause to recount because I forgot to see how many I had even read. I read 92 books this year. That is the most books I have ever read. Thank you, quarantine and more time at home. So yeah, out of the 92, these are going to be my top 10. So I do want to say with that many books and uh, having read that many classics, almost 20 for the year, I will say I've only included like three in my top 10 because my top books are listed as ones that I enjoyed while I was reading them. I was engaged while I was reading them. I was thinking about them when I put the book down. I was talking to them or having dialogue with them while I was reading them. And or after I finished reading them, I was still thinking about the issues in them, about what they meant, about things that they brought up and made me want to research or learn more about or wanted to find myself wanting to engage in conversation with other people about those books. So that's how I'm defining it. I don't think that any one book is meant for every single person to read and to enjoy that, you know, you have to kind of do this. You have to do a little research, say, what are the best books for me. So I am also disclaiming that there are some substantially wonderful, wonderful books. The Wilkie Collins No Names, the Sherlock Holmes books, a lot of these that are just classic, beautiful, beautiful books, and they are not even in my top 10, y'all. So go back and review all my book reviews if you want to hear more about more really good books. But here's the top 10. Number 10. These are going to be in ascending orders, ending with my favorite for the year. So number 10, I'm going to go ahead and give to Jane Eyre. I struggled with this spot right here, but I just felt like this book deserved to be in the top 10. It is a well-loved and read classic. It was definitely enjoyable. Um, it is the story of a young girl loses her parents. Her She's living with an aunt who is not treating her well. It's kind of almost Cinderella-ish. Uh, she goes off to like a governing school and that's not a very good experience, but she kind of starts to get herself established, becomes a governess herself, is going for love. And so this is, this is a coming of age story. This is a story of seeking a place of love and belonging and acceptance and wrestling with kind of past rejections and those kind of events. And she's not a particularly overly bright or beautiful girl. So a lot of people, you know, in that middle normal human range can really resonate with Jane Eyre. And there's a lot of retellings and adaptions and modernizations and all sorts. So this is a great book to pick up and get familiar with. It is a little long. This was a longer one, about 600 pages. So that's number 10. Coming in at number nine, I'm going to give it to The Alice Network by Kate Glass, or Kate Quinn, Kate Quinn. Um, so this is a story that's kind of a little bit like dual story. There is a story that takes place kind of right after World War II, and it is a girl who's looking for a missing cousin. Everybody just accepts that she's died, but she's not at peace with that. She still feels somehow connected or feels like she needs to find out what happened to her cousin um, in the midst of the war and, you know, the Nazis and all that kind of stuff. And so she's on a quest looking for what happened to her cousin. Meanwhile, we're also tied into the Alice Network story, which was a group of female spies that were um, happening during the first war, um, the Great War in, in about 1915, I believe is the year. And so this is based on truth. So I did go and look up some of this historical happenings and it's just fascinating, right? Learning about these brave women that would try to infiltrate and get information safely back. And so it was kind of parts of it were based on true stories and, and kind of my favorite part that was really 
just the highlight was after you've read this and you've kind of gotten invested in the story, there's actually a little section in the back that talks about the history and talks about which characters were actually specifically modeled to be intentionally as close to reality as possible. And so that's just like, you know, really, really amazing. So this book takes that spot. Um, really enjoyed reading it, but I really enjoyed thinking about it afterwards. Then number eight, I'm going to give to Ray Bradbury, Something Wicked This Way Comes. I was reliving my 80s life. Uh, this is a story, if you've read Night Circus and you like that, this feels like its predecessor, right? There is a creepy carnival that shows up at night and has mystical attractions, particularly the carousel that seems to take away people's age, you know, like a fountain of youth kind of thing. And then a maze of mirrors that's very creepy and, and uh, foreboding. And there's centers around a couple of young boys who are kind of getting involved and getting in trouble and getting caught up in this and their community and what they're going through. And it's just a great storytelling. Ray Bradbury is an, a phenomenal storyteller. And so just really, really loved this, loved the whole series that I was reading around this time, learning about history of sci-fi and all that kind of stuff. I really, really enjoy watching Star Trek and some of those kind of grand epic sci-fis, but I don't always read a lot about it, but that one was good. Number seven, I'm going to give to The Woman in the Window, A.J. Finn. This book, I really, really appreciated story of a woman who's dealing, oh, I can't remember the name of the disease, but the one where you have panic attacks if you go outside, you're like kind of trapped to stay home, which, you know, she must have done really well in 2020, right? <laughs> huh? So um, anyway, we're trying to figure out why does she have this condition? And we are particularly interested because she spends her time trying to do some online counseling because she actually has some studies in understanding psychology, but she is mainly watching her neighbor's lives and she thinks she sees a crime and how is that going to play out and how is she going to deal with that being all from her house and what's the dangers of that and how does she interact with her neighbors and, um, and then come to find out her own life and how maybe that influenced and you know, yes, she's been taking some drugs because of her own therapy and did that affect what she was seeing and, you know, all that kind of good stuff. So, so many things that I enjoy about whodunits and, and neighbors and looking out for one another and, and learning about people's health and mental state. So it was a great one. Oh, and the last thing that I did share in my re original review of this um, that makes it particularly good is that she also is an old school movie buff. And so she was watching old school movies and there's the old school movie about uh, Rear Window where he's like looking out and watching a crime. And it's basically the story of this book. And that one's not in here, but she talks about all these other old timey movies. That's brilliant. At number six, right? We got... Pride and Prejudice. This is such a good classic. And I was surprised, actually. I thought I was going to like it because it's one of the most acclaimed classics ever. Um, and I've never, I hadn't even seen the movie until I read the book. It's one of those I kept holding out to read the book. So this is the story um, that centers around Elizabeth and Mr. Darcy. And it's probably, dare I say, the biggest, most popular romance because Pride and Prejudice kind of says it all, right? You know, they're prideful and they have all these preconceived notions and prejudice that they have to overcome to realize that really they have a whole lot in common and, you know, uh, there's really a awesome romance, but we have to play out in a substantial, sophisticated society way all of the <laughs> pomp and circumstance and drama that goes along with that. And it's just lovely. It's just a fun, fun ride and I actually enjoyed it more than I thought I was going to enjoy it. So I, I, and I appreciate how much of new writings and stories and movies take from this. So it's awesome to have that kind of background and understand kind of the predecessors, if you will. Number five, I'm going to give to Mark Stewart from 
Audio Adrenaline, he wrote a biography memoir on um, losing my voice to find it, losing my voice to find it. And I did not say in my original review the the what his new voice was because I thought it was a spoiler alert, but it says in the front flap. So here it is, y'all. So he was a rock star for a Christian band back mostly in the very early 90s and then going all the way into the 2000s. Um, and he got, it wasn't, it was much more serious than laryngitis, but it was a disease of the vocal cords and he's the lead singer and he basically was losing his voice. And so it's a story of forming the band originally, traveling the band. If you liked re reading Daisy Jones and the Six, which I can also recommend, um, which is the, a story of, of a fictitious band and all the sex, drugs, rock and roll and things that go along with a traveling band. So this is kind of like that, you know, the roadies and the, the pit stops and the cars breaking down and all these kind of adventures that bands have is also in this book. And I just super enjoyed reading all the backstories and then reading about his personal struggle and just how gritty and real he made that because it's, I mean, it would be hard for anybody to lose their voice, but if that's so ingrained in your personality because you're a lead singer, and he basically, his parents were missionaries in Haiti, so at a couple points he goes down to kind of go home, so to speak, to be with his family, and he gets tied into doing ministry in Haiti, and he's actually in Haiti when that earthquake hit, 2005, I think was the year that that it hit and he because he was well known he actually was one of the main spokespeople on behalf of the Haitian people back on CNN and um, back to the states and just trying to get aid down there and so that is kind of you know a secondary thing watching how the Lord used him first through his music career which I was part of working for a church and taking teens to his concerts um, actually having met him and prayed for him when his voice was going uh, poorly so my personal life was actually woven into this and I was definitely talking to this book and just loved it to pieces but I I'm a little biased in that, so that's my disclaimer. I think that anybody who would like to have that background of following bands and a story, particularly one with faith-based, um, would really enjoy this book. Number four. These are all good, y'all. I get so excited. <laughs> Number four, Shadow of the Wind by Carlos Ruiz Zafron. And so I didn't know this is a series, y'all. So I have gotten the second one and I am super excited to read it. This is basically um, centers around the story of a boy who loses his mom and he's worried he's going to forget her. And the dad takes him to a kind of labyrinth of books in a mysterious library. And it kind of has like mystical, magical powers and the book He's supposed to choose a book that kind of chooses him and he chooses the shadow of the wind. And so as he's reading that story and trying to figure out what happened to the author and then the book itself is kind of shadowing his own life and paralleling it, if you will. And so that he's like going through it. And then the back of the book even has uh, maps and a walk, if you will, through Spain, through the parts, obviously the magical bookstore is fictitious, but a lot of it is centered around things that are really there or really happening. And so it just has a, that feel that's just a really fun kind of national treasure or, you know, trying to solve the backstory historical mysteries, if you will. And I loved it, loved it, had so much fun another fairly good size book what it's a 500 509 pages oh and there's there's the pictures and um maps in the back so if I ever go to that part of the world it would be really fun to even walk it but I'm going to totally totally in 2021 be reading the rest of that series <sighs> number four or three Three. <laughs> Number three, A Stone of Hope by Jim St. Germain. So this 
I don't know, um, you know, that it's the highest literary. You know, you could you could argue that certain classics have more literary value, but this one was so just engaging to read. A memoir of a young man, age of 10, comes over from Haiti to live in Brooklyn and has to navigate street life and the gang situation and trying to stay out of trouble, although it's kind of inevitable and the cards are stacked against him and he ends up in the system and he starts asking questions and he he gets in around enough right people that encourage him and challenge him in a positive way and so he goes on to college and on to law school and starts learning about some of the um, means and mechanisms of the system itself and is even today trying to advocate for positive change for racial equality and reconciliation for some of those dialogues speaking at congress talking to the presidents and to um you know people who have the some power and so this was just really really encouraging and fascinating and inspiring and i do have a strong heart for haiti i've only been there the one time but it just feels like you know a place that is longing kind of for that reconciliation and hope so i really appreciated the stone of hope it was very reminiscent of uh the other book that I read, if you want to check out my book reviews for December, same kind of flavor. Number two spot, top books of the year. Ironically, it's two and two. So two and two gets number two spot. And this was a book that I originally picked up at the Dollar Tree. I gifted that particular copy, but I loved it so much I wanted to maintain my own copy. So I bought a used copy from a library book sale so I could have it. Um, and the author is Rafe Bartholomew. Rafe by Bartholomew. He writes a memoir of his life growing up where his dad was working at McSoley, McSoley's in New York City and that bar is arguably at least in the top two oldest and they say it is the, the oldest because they did not even shut down for prohibition. They still remained open. And they call it two and two because all you can order is ale and it's either dark or light and it only comes served in two mugs so you so even if you're one person it's two so two lights or two darks that's how it's served that's what you order that's what you get that's what they're famous for they have some food or whatnot but it's really all about the ale and uh, it's an irish feel and uh, just the characters and some of the more famous people that have come through the bar. They talk about having Super Bowl and what's that like. Talk about having St. Patrick's Day at an Irish, you know, pub and what that's like. What it was like to be there during Hurricane Sandy and a crisis. It doesn't, of course, update into 2020 with the COVID crisis. So I am strongly rooting that they were able to figure out a way to stay in business and stay afloat during this year. Um, but this was just such a fun book in the sense of creating not only my knowledge of New York City, my knowledge of some history talking about they were present for soldiers going off to war and collecting some of those stories, right? Or his family story. He frames it with his grandfather and his father and does a beautiful chapter devoted to his mother and kind of ends with this legacy of recognizing that he is a descendant and carrying on the legacy of his forefathers. And it was just beautiful, beautiful job. I just loved it. And I paid originally a dollar for that. And then my number one book, <laughs> That if you've been following me and following my other five stars, you probably can guess what I'm going to say. It's Brandon Sanderson's Hero of Ages. And technically, I read The Well of Ascension this year. I started with Mistborn last year. It made my top books of last year. 
And so I did say quite a bit about this book in my December reviews, but if you're just watching this one because you just want to skip right forward to the best of, this is actually a young adult series that is about a magic system and a little sci-fi, but if you like grand epic adventures, if you are into that kind of Star Wars, Lord of the Rings, epic, big Game of Thrones even, you know, where there is that very clear darkness and very clear light side and you're trying to figure out how to defeat the darkness and how to respond to creation. There is a magic system that centers around metals and the beautiful story uh, is Vin, who's the orphan girl who is trying to find her place and gets involved with the band of rebels that are trying to bring about justice on earth as well as trying to heal the lands and figure out what this is and just discovering her own powers, how to use them and how to be a good force. And then there is a beautiful story about the keepers, uh, one of whom is Sazed, who collects religions and talks about trying to make sense of all of it. And it is just so striking and beautiful and you figure out some stuff, but it is a complex story that's one of those kind of like Lord of the Rings where you've got several different battle fronts and several different things going on at once and you're just never bored. And if you are, just hold on a minute because in 10 minutes we're going to be in a new storyline. And it's just, I love the way it all came together. I didn't feel like there was a, you know, a whole lot of things hanging loose at the end beyond what you would want, you know, beyond what was allowed us to fill in the blanks or to create in our own minds. And it was just really, really well done. And that was definitely my most enjoyable favorite read that I probably recommend to more people than not, just because if I like it and people have similar taste to my reading or they're generally people who come to me for recommendations I just say hey it's young adult it is sci-fi but it's worth checking out I mean read the back cover and see if it sounds at all appealing so those are my top books for 2020 I am super excited about a lot of things that I have on my to be read coming up. If you have books that you think that I would like, particularly based on these books and reviews, please leave them in the comments. I just, I, I feel at peace when I have a stack of books just waiting to be read. It just makes me happy and brings me joy and I just keep rearranging them how I want to read them. If there's a book that you know that I have that you want a review of, leave that below and I will see if I have it and see if maybe I can bump it up a little bit for you. And if you have a favorite classic in particular, I am still working my way through the classics. I feel like I'm making a lot of progress, but I still have quite a few to go. So leave me your favorite all-time classics and um, I may do an update to my favorite classics. I have one out there, but it may be time to revisit that pretty soon too. And I look forward to spending more time with you and book reviews. So keep it going. I will see you soon.